Hey everybody, this is James Lindsay, and you are listening to the New Discourses Podcast. And I want to do something, I mean, I don't like doing this, I don't love doing this as a, as a podcast, but I do it a lot, and um, what I want to do is I want to go through an essay I wrote on New Discourses recently that was extremely popular, I got incredible feedback, some people got really mad, which means it's really good, um, which is titled The Basis for Classical Liberalism, but I want to explore that idea a little further and draw out one of its conclusions actually drawing it out back to the source why, where I originally got the idea and introduce you to one of the most compelling books um, on on classical liberalism and liberal thought that I've read in a long time, a very long time. And that book is called Kindly Inquisitors by Jonathan Rausch. Jonathan Rausch, unfortunately, uh, kind of didn't end up heeding his own advice and got a nasty case of TDS and uh, critical care um, Covidiacy, but uh, so it goes. That's beside the point. The book was written in 1991, Kindly Inquisitors, and is shockingly prescient, talking about what was coming in terms of whether it's woke or political correctness or whatever you want to call it. So having written this in 1991, which is, you know, 32 years ago, more 33 probably by the time he wrote it, and to have this much valuable stuff to say is pretty remarkable. When I read it a couple of years ago, I was just shocked by how overwhelmingly clear it is on what classical liberalism really is as a conflict resolution system, as a, in particular, the book is mostly about uh, what he refers to, I think, awkwardly looking back on it now as liberal science. I think that liberal science would be a term especially we capitalize the L and the S, that at least with its colloquial understanding would be something we look down on as the science, as a form of scientism. That's not what he means by it. He's searching in the dark for a name for uh, the broadly fallibilist skepticism that drives Enlightenment liberal thinking in the domain of epistemology, as opposed to how market economies arise in the domain of economics and Republican democracy arises in the domain of politics. And this was a very formative book. So I want to first point out that this book was, in fact, formative of the ideas that I'm about to share from the essay, which was very popular. I said I don't like doing this, which is true. I wish people just read the thing and I don't have to read it to you. But I also find it uh nice to be able to communicate to more people because not everybody likes to read and a lot of people like to listen and they don't have time or opportunity to read. So to communicate those ideas in a second form, so it's like the audiobook version, I'll probably, like I usually do, riff on this a little bit. But this essay was on New Discourses. I published it on November 10th, 23, and it is titled The Basis of Cla- uh, Classical Liberalism. If you want to look it up, it f- uh, features a picture of a statue of George Washington kneeling Uh, in prayer with his sword laid on uh, the ground by his side, which is an iconic statue. And it begins with these words, which I think are, in fact, the basis of all of classical liberalism. We are not God. We cannot become God, make God, or speak with the authority of God. This is axiomatic and the beginning of wisdom and prosperity. Now, before I carry on, I'm going to riff, I want to talk about why I said this is axiomatic, and in fact, why I said it's the beginning of wisdom and prosperity. Um, why is why do I claim this is axiomatic? What does that mean? Uh, what I mean is that it's actually self-evident. I think regardless of whether you are religious or not religious, we are not God is a self-evident statement. Now, I know this contradicts the orthodoxy of a large number of faiths which is extremely um, uncomfortable. We're not God, and we cannot become God, make God, or speak with the authority of God. I think this is a self-evident truth, and I mean that with all of the authority of the Declaration of Independence saying that there are these self-evident truths, that we have certain rights endowed by our Creator uh, that are inalienable, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, is how Jefferson wrote that down, uh, to paraphrase, not quote exactly. And I, I think it's obvious. If you are religious... If you are humbly religious and your religion is based on the love and the fear of God, it begins with the humility to recognize you are not God. 
God is something other than you are that is sovereign over you. If you are not religious, maybe you don't believe in God at all. You know you're not God if you don't think there is one at all. So you shouldn't act like one. You shouldn't act like we can build an AI system or a computer or a social system or a government that can become or act as God or act like God or speak with the authority of God or control people like God. So that's why I say it's axiomatic. I say it's the beginning of wisdom and prosperity because I think it is, with wisdom, the beginning of setting ourselves aside, getting ourselves out of the way, getting our own egos, our own um, arrogance, and our hubris out of the way. The belief that we are or can become God is not wise. It is the classic hubristic error. And so the beginning of wisdom is knowing that we don't have it, that we have limitations, that we have limited knowledge. And the beginning of prosperity is that since we're not God, we can humble ourselves and we can start to work together to solve our problems the way that we intend to, um, as I'm going to lay out. And in particular, what it leads to, where we get to prosperity, is that it leads to the enshrining of our fundamental rights, including the fundamental right to have property and to trade that property according to whatever uh, whatever policies or, or preferences that we have. That's the basis of the market economy. It also is the basis, I think, we'll come to to see that it's uh, of a democratic, liberal, uh, or democratic-republican form of government that allows for prosperity to build. And I think the evidence of history has been clear. Once we unlocked this secret, we had tremendous prosperity. We enjoy a standard of living and uh, that the world has never seen before. We have life expectancy, that, except that it's now kind of starting to decline, the world had never seen before. We had infant mortality better than the world has ever seen. And I'm not about to repeat the kind of stupid, optimistic argument that I think Steven Pinker makes. I think Steven Pinker is ultimately Hegelian in his thinking, and I don't really respect it that much. I don't think that that's the liberalism that I'm talking about. I think that he's kind of caught up in the progressive liberal idea, very much like uh, Fukuyama in his Last Man in End of History. I'm not particularly interested in that. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'll start again and then continue without the interruption. We are not God. We cannot become God, make God, or speak with the authority of God. This is axiomatic and the beginning of wisdom and prosperity. Because we are not God, we cannot know the full nature of God, or even for certainty whether God exists at all. As a result, we cannot know any purpose, including ultimate purpose, each of our lives may have. Because we cannot know the full nature of God should he exist, nor any purpose our lives might have in his sight, we lack the authority to compel the beliefs of others, lest we lead them into ultimate error. In particular, we therefore lack the authority to alienate anyone, self or other, from the possibility of fulfilling that purpose. In short, lacking the authority of God, we lack justification for the compulsion of our fellow man. This is a not complicated idea. Okay, let me just summarize what I meant by that. This is not a complicated idea. We don't know if there's God or not, but we're not him. Whether there's God or not, our lives might have purposes beyond the little local things that we care about, that we busy ourselves with. It might have ultimate purpose. There might be a teleological component to human existence. If God exists and God is described uh, in, in most of the religions, there probably is. It might be to reach enlightenment. It might be to humble yourself and serve God. It might be to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior by humbling yourself again. It might be to submit to the will of Allah. It might be a lot of things. There might be an ultimate purpose. And here's the thing. Without being God, we don't actually know, nobody knows for certain what that ultimate purpose is. Your theology might mean everything to you, and you might be utterly convicted that that is your ultimate purpose in life. But the problem is, you don't have any tool by which you can convince your neighbor of that same conviction other than explaining why it matters to you. And if you're wrong, you have led somebody off, they might be convicted to their own path. Let's say it's a Protestant, I know it's generic, and a Catholic. Each one has different views on salvation, or a Catholic and, and a Muslim. They have completely different views. 
And I'm not making an apology that we can't judge religions here or have cultural that we need cultural relativism. That's not what's going on here. What I'm saying is each of those describes a difference in the pathway to ultimate purpose in life. And if either one of those is wrong and it compels somebody in the other to abandon that and join in to the wrong thing, they've committed an ultimate error. So we might have purposes. We might not. We might have our own purposes to decide for ourselves, but what we lack in that none of us is God is the authority to alienate anybody from the possibility of fulfilling their life's purposes. So as I said, in short, lacking the authority of God, we lack justification for the compulsion of our fellow man. We might convince, we might try to coerce. I don't think that's good because that's a compulsion. Um, we might exhort, we might do a lot of different things. We might in particular try to persuade and convince our fellow man to follow this path or that path, but we can't compel our fellow man to do anything because we lack the authority. That's why I say this is the beginning of wisdom and prosperity, because nobody gets to tell anybody what to do or how to do it. Continuing, in that we all lack the authority of God and thus ju- uh, sorry, and thus any justification for the compulsion of our fellow man, all men are created politically equal. Nothing in the world, which is also not God, justifies an intrinsically limited human being to hold political or social authority over another without the consent of both parties to that relationship. Any authority we can hold over any other person must therefore be earned, provisional, temporary, and voluntarily given and accepted. So anybody who has the capacity to consent must consent to any relationship of authority. If you want somebody to be your teacher, you have to consent to be their student, and they have to consent to be your teacher. If you want somebody to be your boss, you have to consent to them being your boss, and they have to consent to having you as an employee, and so on and so forth. I've said earned, provisional, temporary, and voluntarily given and accepted. Another way to put that also is that it needs to be special. Nobody has general authority over others, but they can adopt special authority, say, by being elected to an office that has certain authorities given to that office for them to execute. Now, the flip side of that coin is that if they are not executing faithfully the duties of that office, we should be able to kick them out of it because their uh, authority was earned, provisional, temporary, and voluntarily given and accepted. Going on, men, by their morally limited nature, which is sometimes called fallen, often seek to compel the belief, speech, and action of other men, both for good reasons and bad. The primary mechanisms by which a man can successfully compel another man to belief, speech, or action are through credible threats to his life, liberty, and livelihood, generally recognized in the last case as his property. Further, because of the nature of the ultimate privacy of conscience, which men may have any number of good reasons to keep private from other men, undue violation of the privacy of man and the contents of his mind can coerce him. Any who can destroy another's life, liberty, or livelihood, or sufficiently violate his privacy, can compel his belief, speech, and activity, and thus alienate him through destruction or compulsion from any potential ultimate purpose he may have. Only God could possibly hold such authority, and we are and cut, sorry, and we are not God. No man can justify claiming such authority. Thus, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that we are not God, and by virtue of that, we have been endowed by that which led to our existence, our Creator, whether the laws of nature or nature's God, with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are his life, liberty, and property, including the property of the private contents of our minds and the ability to make use of these to pursue our happiness, fortunes, and whatever purposes, ultimate or otherwise, there may be within and of our lives. These rights and the privacy necessary to maintain them shall be set aside and therefore, in light of the original meaning of the word, regarded as holy. Because men must nevertheless live among one another in as much peace and in, as, in, in pursuit of as much prosperity as we may attain, some political system, a just government, needs to be instituted among them, 
not for their rule, but for the securing of these holy and unalienable rights. The primary purpose of a just government is therefore to secure these rights and to facilitate the peaceful resolution of conflicts and disputes that arise between men as a result of them and their individual differences. What must such a government abide by then so that it can... I, I want to get the stress on that correct. What must such a government abide by then, so that it can achieve this sacred task without itself alienating man from that which is unalienable? So let me make clear what I'm saying there. How can government secure our rights without violating our rights itself? See, government too is not God, no matter in what way it is instituted among men. It cannot become God, neither can it make God, nor can it speak or act with the authority of God. It must abide by limitations of nearly every imaginable sort and must secure the inalienable rights of man from itself and others. Because a government lacks the authority of God, a just government has no intrinsic political authority over the men among whom it is constituted. Did you get that? No intrinsic political authority. It's not automatically our ruler just because it's the government. What I say is, that is, a just government cannot rule. It cannot govern except with the consent of those whom it governs. Since government cannot usurp the authority to rule, Law must rule in its place, subject to mechanisms of production and amendment that guarantee the participation and consent of those over whom it rules. In that, none possess, in that none possesses any special political authority, none can be exempt from the law that is instituted amongst men for their own just governance. So immediately from assuming that we're not God, the rule of law falls out if we just believe that the role of a government, if it is just, is not to rule, but to serve, and to serve in the capacity of securing rights from and, uh, itself and one another. What you end up with is rule of law. And a process has to come into being that allows us to create and amend law so that it is still operating with our consent, so that it is timely to what is going on in the world. Turns out, if you're going to operate in a system where nobody has intrinsic political authority, they only have temporary and, uh, and borrowed political authority, special political authority, you're going to need a Republican form of governance. And that Republican form of governance is going to have to install its offices with the consent of those it governs. In other words, something, at least in some form, democratic. All governments, including a just government, must possess and wield political authority, however, including to produce and enforce the law, which rules in its stead. That authority in a just government is of the people, by the people, and for the people, and as such it is all loaned political authority, ultimately answerable at any time to the people it governs, is provisional, and subject to the limits of time, scope, and checks and balances on its power. A just government must be democratic in nature to obtain the consent of those it governs, but it cannot secure the rights of the few against the many unless the democracy is republican in application. So immediately, not only do you get the rule of law, as I said, you get the republican democracies that we operate in, I guess democratic republics that we operate in. Servants must be, con that means public servants, servants must be consented to by the people they represent. Fair and impartial elections must be held at intervals to loan political authority to public servants and to pass it to others at want or need, or else it usurps an authority greater than itself to which it can claim no right. The greater must be given a say, and the lesser must be granted enough representation to counter the tide of opinion held prejudicially or negligently against it. A just government must secure the rights of speech, press, protest, and petition, or it cannot be held to account, and the consent with which it governs cannot be duly informed. In other words, the First Amendment is absolutely necessary as a consequence as well, because otherwise the government will overstep its bounds. You can't govern with the consent of the governed if the people you are governing can't tell you you violated their consent. Its powers must be limited, divided, and placed into a system of checks and balances to prevent it from any illegitimate claim to rule with political authority it cannot have. Government is not God because we are not God. Just governments understand this and keep it. 
unjust governments reject this and run afoul of it and the men they are meant to serve. A just government cannot compel the beliefs, speech, or actions of men because it lacks any such authority, which cannot be given even on loan, and it consequently cannot deprive men of their lives, liberties, or properties, or a reasonable expectation of privacy without the due process of law pursuant to its solitary sacred objective to secure the inalienable rights of those whom it serves and protects. It therefore must secure the right to believe, speak, and worship, as well as the rights to defend oneself against any and all attempts to alienate men from those fundamental rights which he retains inalienably. It cannot punish cruelly or unusually, torture or compel any man to profess his own guilt. So look at that. We get the rest of the First Amendment, all of the Second Amendment, kind of the Third and Fourth Amendments, definitely the Fifth Amendment, and the Eighth Amendment falling straight out of just the assumption that we are not God. Because individual belief and conscience is self-evidently inviolate, just government consequently must also secure a right to privacy without interference in private spaces and a reasonable expectation of limited privacy even in public spaces. Before I continue, I want to point out that the internet is a weird space that is simultaneously private and public. You're in your house, maybe in your underwear, playing on the internet, but meanwhile, you are engaging in public fora, and your device is able to spy on you either through your posts on, on, on social or media or public forums, which we kind of generally agree is fine, I guess. They can watch whatever's on Twitter. They can see what's on Twitter, Facebook, etc. But can they really gather all of your metadata? Should they really be keeping your browsing history? Is that really anybody's business? No, not really. Should your camera be able to be secretly turned on on your camera watching you and determining what you're doing, what you're looking at, what your uh, eyes are, are focused on, whether you're engaged, what engages you more? No, absolutely not. So we have a reasonable right to privacy. I think this one's extremely important, and I put so much emphasis on privacy in this essay because I feel like it's the piece that the founders of the U.S. overlooked because they could take it for granted. We are not properly securing our right to privacy without interference in private spaces and a reasonable expectation of limited privacy even in public spaces, given A, surveillance cameras everywhere in public, and B, um, these devices, which are this weird hybrid public-private space, and people expect, they have a reasonable expectation of more privacy than they're given in terms of what data is recorded and what their phone is paying attention to, listening to, uh, taking pictures of, uh, videoing, or whatever else it can do with all of the devices. Um, I had this idea the other day. Imagine that your phone were to start delivering, imagine we had a social credit system and you have to watch these propaganda videos on your phone like three times a day or else your social credit goes bad and it you just have to do that. But the camera is actually tracking your eyes to make sure you're looking at and engaged on the commercial or the propaganda video or whatever it is while they're showing it to you. And you lose social credit if you lose engagement. Like your cam the ca camera has to be turned on watching you watch the propaganda using AI to determine if you're actually engaging in the propaganda. This is a complete violation of our expected right to privacy. In fact, it's a right to a violation of our right to free speech, which includes the right not to have to listen to things that we don't want to listen to, particularly in private. So anyway, I'll start the paragraph over. Because individual belief in conscience is self-evidently inviolate, just government consequently must also secure a right to privacy without interference in private spaces and a reasonable expectation of limited privacy even in public spaces. In that governments are not God because we are not God and they are instituted amongst us, they have... They have no authority to violate the inner sanctity of the human mind in any person, neither to torture nor to surveil persons without justified suspicion or manipulate their beliefs, actions, and environments so as to coerce them against their self-determined will. So, guess what? Get your psychological nudge theory out of here, guys. That's not okay. And stop surveilling us through our devices, whether that's data mining, whether that's actually more intrusive things like the camera or the microphone picking things up. That's all unacceptable. That all violates our intrinsic, inviolable rights, our inalienable rights. It is absolutely outside of what our government should be allowed to do. And uh, a just government cannot do that. And we need to figure that out and remember it and start asserting it. Instead, I go on, 
As with our other unalienable rights, just governments have a duty to secure a reasonable right to privacy between citizens and hold no right to violate that right themselves. Because we are also not God, none of us individually has any such authority over one another either. In other words, Google can't do it either. Neither can Twitter. Neither can your neighbor. As with just governments, just individuals must obtain any social or political authority they hold over another man by obtaining his consent, because none possess intrinsic authority over others. Consent to hold political authority must not be absolute and should be given freely and under contract according to merits and on terms determined by both relevant parties to be acceptable to each. So because we're not God and we have rule of law, we need contracts. We need contract law. We need a contracted society. Political authority between adults is therefore extended by virtue of demonstrated competence that is compelling to those in the relationship. Just governments should secure these arrangements and establish courts of justice to facilitate the resolution of conflicts between parties. The courts must adjudicate the law with impartiality, favoring neither the greater nor the lesser, and only under such judicial restraint should just men submit to the court. Arbitrary power must be resisted, and any doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd, slavish, and destructive of the good and happiness of mankind. Courts must therefore be impartial in carrying out the law. Because belief cannot be compelled likewise, none possess the authority to compel another to believe in any idea, right or wrong, true or false. Therefore, no proposition is to be regarded as true or good by virtue of he who made it. Every proposition earns its authority through processes of validation that demand it survive challenge by competing ideas that ultimately must be brought to bear against our best assessment. To bre- sorry, be brought to bear against our best assessment of the laws of nature, of objective reality, or of God's creation, which by definition cannot be wrong or false, and rests outside of, but is accessible to each and every man. Men can establish themselves as authorities, to which others can consent or not, based upon their demonstrated capacities to determine that which is right and true through the successful applications of their talents and perceptions, in that every man is not God, which is to say he is limited and finite. No man obtains special or final authority on any of his proclamations of rightness or truth and must consent to seeing his own ideas challenged by those of others. That is the Kindly Inquisitor's paragraph that I'm going to elaborate on when I read the book here in a second after I finish this. Because our right to own property is inalienable, so is our right to do with our property what we will so long as it doesn't violate the inalienable rights of others. In other words, we have the right not only to hold our property but to engage in commerce with it according to the principles of free enterprise under the law. Property can be exchanged by any two parties who mutually consent to the terms of the contract of exchange without undue interference by third parties, and a just government should secure this right to engage in commerce under its duty to secure the rights of each citizen's property. In summary, we are not God. The consequences of this self-evident proposition are vast. None of us possesses the authority to compel another or his belief because we lack in our limitation understanding of the significance of any error against his intrinsic value and potential purpose made in that way. We therefore self-evidently start with the project of organizing our society from a position of political equality with certain rights that are inalienable. Among these life, liberty, property, capacity for their use toward our happiness and purposes, and a reasonable expectation of privacy in which we can maintain their sanctity. Lacking authority to rule over one another, we are ruled instead by law and merit and lend social and political authority in limited ways, such as through processes that are open in their nature and that may best determine these as objectively as we may. Individual belief is sacrosanct, not because any man is God, but because every man is not. The individual is politically inviolate because he is the vessel of his own sacrosanct individual beliefs. Together, these provocative and humbling ideas and the social and political project they define have a name. 
these are classical liberalism. So that's the essay. Um, thank you for letting me read it and riff on it a little bit. I'm going to now read a couple of pages from, uh, I guess this is the um, expanded edition of Kindly Inquisitors, uh, The New Attacks on Free Thought by Jonathan Rausch, which was originally published in 1991. Uh, this particular edition, which is the one that has red, white, and blue stripes and a little French guy looking thing cartoon on the cover, if you end up picking it up, uh, is from pages, um, let's see, at least 45 and 46. We'll see where I decide to stop. So here's Rausch. In its most peculiar and extreme philosophical form, skepticism refers to the doctrine that we have no reason to believe anything and so should believe nothing. So Rausch, by the way, is not in favor of this radical skepticism, this radical skepticism that's actually at the heart of postmodern thinking in some way. He says, that, however, on its face is an unsustainable argument. Believing in nothing is impossible. Even the belief that you are justified in believing nothing is a belief. And even when we refuse to conclude, we do so only against the background of other conclusions. No one could possibly be a genuinely beliefless skeptic, even in principle. The skepticism upon which liberal science is based is something quite different. Now, let me reassert what he means by the term liberal science. Liberal science is the, uh, in, the enlightenment, really, uh, what am I looking for? The enlightenment epistemological method. Uh, it's what, as we'll hear from him, what philosophers refer to as fallibilism. Uh, it's not this extreme radical skepticism, but it is skepticism that we are going to make sure that what we see is not taken at face value, that we're not believing something just because of who said it, and that we are going to check and test our propositions, A, for logical coherence and consistency, validity and soundness, and B, against the best available evidence to see if they are in correspondence to reality. In other words, it's a, it's a subscription to the correspondence theory of truth and the general scientific methodologies, which he's referring to as liberal science, which is, in retrospect, a horrible term, uh, as, as a means of discerning what things we should believe, that all things we should believe in the provisional sense that all fallibilists agree to believe in. So he says, the skepticism, skepticism upon which liberal science is based is something quite different. To distinguish it from the kind which says that we should never conclude anything, philosophers often call it fallibilism. That's what I was just saying. Fallibilism is a school of thought that we're allowed to believe things, knowing that we're probably not perfectly accurate in what we're saying. He says, this kind of skepticism says cheerfully that we have to draw conclusions, but that we may regard none of our conclusions as being beyond any further scrutiny or change. And that's the key point. Go ahead and conclude whatever you want, he says. Just remember that all of your conclusions, every single one of them, may need to be corrected. Now, there's a very sophisticated method of the fallibilist philosophy that was put forth by Stephen Hawking before he died, together with his partner, uh, Leonard Mladenow, his working partner, uh, who's at Caltech, or was at Caltech. I don't know if he's still at Caltech and I might have that wrong. Maybe he's at UCLA. Anyway, brilliant cosmologist, Stephen Hawking, obviously a world-famous cosmologist. And they dipped into a uh, philosophy of science vein, I want to say in 2012. I talked to Leonard to his face about it in 2015, so it must be before that, in a book they wrote together, I think that was called The Grand Design. I'd have to look that up again. But the, the model they put forth, or the, the philosophy of, of fallibilism they put forth, is what they call model-dependent realism. So we can assume that what our models are talking about, whether it's models of physics, whether it's models of whatever, uh, chemistry, are describing reality. However, we know that there is this, this epistemic wall between us and the final ontological truth. We don't know the real nature, say, of a proton. We don't actually know what a proton is, but we have a physical model that explains what protons are, how protons work, lots of math is involved, and that model makes really freaking accurate uh, predictions and, and descriptions. So what we can say then is that there is some phenomenon, we don't know for sure, this is a, the ontology point, this is the metaphysics part, there's some phenomenon out there 
This is, by the way, how I think about the world, if you want to know my philosophy ultimately. There's some phenomenon out there. We have a model, and in that model, that phenomenon is described by a thing called a proton. And a proton in that model operates this way and this way and this way. And this is how good a prediction and a description the model can give for that object called a proton in that particular model. And so given model dependence, given the model, given that we accept that the model is a description of reality that is ultimately limited in its ontological reach, we can conclude that the proton is a real thing that behaves as described. That's model-dependent realism. That's, in my opinion, the most sophisticated articulation of a position in the philosophy of science. Uh, it goes way beyond instrumentalism, although Victor Stenger, uh, who I wrote an essay on this with in 2014, couldn't see how it was different from instrumentalism. I think it's far more sophisticated. Um, it's not strictly positivistic in terms of that which we can prove is all that there is. It just says that we're going to accept as real the objects of models, and then we're going to tell, uh, tell everybody that, well, here's limitations on the model, or this is how good the model is in general. And that gives us the uh, kind of a measurement in some sense, generically or vaguely or tacitly measurement on how much we should trust the model in the first place. But so far as a model that's really robust, like I know there are problems with it, but like the standard model of physics, it makes amazing predictions. It's extremely accurate for the things that it does. It does have some issues on some edges. We're all starting to learn this now. But the fact of the matter is we can take for granted, when once we assume the model, we can take for granted that that model is describing real phenomena that are provisional to the model correctly named and described. That's the idea that I think that liberal science is kind of going to in its kind of best expression. I could elaborate on this some more, but I think it'll get dull. You should go read The Grand Design by Hawking and Mladenow. And it's ML at the beginning, Mladenow, uh, and see what you think of it. So going back to Rausch, he says, this attitude does not require you to renounce knowledge. So it doesn't require radical skepticism. It requires you only to renounce certainty which is not the same thing. What it, makes, what it means is it forces you to embrace humility. At least, you don't, you don't have to be humble for yourself, but there has to be an overarching hum, humility to how uh, we're going to interact with one another and, the, and, and, and our ideas. In fact, you have to divorce yourself from your ideas at some point. You can go advocate for them or whatever, but the ideal circumstance is that you are actually going to take yourself out of it and humble yourself before the world in the, better, in the presentation of potentially better ideas. So it's rooted deeply in humility rather than arrogance. It requires you, this is Rausch again, it requires you only to renounce certainty, which is not the same thing. In other words, your knowledge is always tentative and subject to correction. At the bottom of this kind of skepticism is a simple proposition. We must all take seriously the idea that any and all of us might at any time be wrong. So let me go back to model-dependent realism for just a second. What would that mean? Well, the model in, say, the standard model of physics or the general relativity model of gravitation and so on seems to be extremely accurate. We have really, really great predictions. We have really great descriptions. We, we have incredible experimental confirmation and observational confirma confirmation. So it's true, right? Well, no, not necessarily. And we all have to accept that some other theory, which I hate to invoke Thomas Kuhn at all, some other theory might subsume GR at some point and uh, lead us to see that what we thought of as GR was a kind of naive understanding of a deeper or more profound phenomenon. This is what Thomas Kuhn referred to as a paradigm shift in which like every postmodern and critical whack job and probably to a degree Thomas Kuhn himself took completely wrongly. The book for, from Kuhn is uh, The Nature of Scientific Revolutions. Uh, this They went completely out. Oops, it's all out the window. But no, model-dependent realism puts it all right back in the window. We're allowed to update our models or even replace our models and say that these models do a better job with that vague or tacit sense of how accurate the model is overall. We are all perfectly permitted to throw out the model and say, whoops, we were wrong about things that we were absolutely certain of because our realism, because of the ontological, the wall between... Uh, objective between us and objective ontology uh, is is I think absolute I don't think that that wall can be crossed the wall between physics and metaphysics I don't think is is uh, very permeable um, 
So we can we can say, yeah, we were completely right within the context of that model, but that model itself had to be subsumed into a greater one. We have the perfect example of that, which is, of course, that Newton's theory of gravitation got subsumed by GR, by general relativity. So we see that what that looks like in practice. Did it say that Newton was wrong? No, it actually didn't. It said that Newton gives really freaking and excellent and simple approximations for low speeds and low gravitational fields. That's what it actually says. Um, those are going to require corrections under certain phenomena, but it's actually that Newton's is a oversimplification. It's not wrong. It is, uh, it's, a, it's a model that's incredibly accurate to a narrower set of phenomena than, um, than everything. And so that's kind of how these things actually sort of work. And this isn't meant to be a complicated philosophy of science podcast. I don't want to get into it. But Newton's laws of motion are themselves accurate enough where we could take Elon Musk's rocket, if it worked, and launch a space probe to Jupiter or Uranus. Haha, <laughs> ha, Uranus. Elon could send his rocket to Uranus. Ha ha ha. It never gets old, by the way. And we could get there with it with like one second accuracy. We could plot plot a course, launch a rocket, this huge explosion shooting out of the back of a cylinder, send this thing into space, and get there with just with the calculations of Newton within one second of accuracy on a trip that might take, you know, a decade. It's a good model. GR is a better model. Turns out none of your GPS works without incorporating general relativity because the gravitational field of the Earth actually screws things up that much. So, as it turns out, you need a better model in other circumstances. But we're not dealing with that. At the bottom of this skepticism is the, simple, the fallibilist proposition of so-called liberal science, in Rausch's words. At the bottom of this kind of skepticism is a simple proposition. We must all take seriously the idea that any and all of us might at any time be wrong. Now, there's another way to phrase that, which I started this podcast with, which is, we are not God. Or the way that it was put by Socrates uh, is that it would. It, he was asked if he possesses wisdom, and he says, no, wisdom is the domain of the gods. Sophia is the domain of the gods. The most that man can do, and this is the beginning of wisdom and prosperity, is love wisdom, philo, love, wisdom, Sophia, philo, Sophia, philosophy. It is not the possession of wisdom. It is not becoming wise in our own sight and thus becoming fools, it is loving wisdom, loving the truth, or loving God, as it were. So we must all take seriously the idea that any and all of us must, or might at any time, sorry, not must, might at any time be wrong, because we are not God, so we better humble ourselves, and we better love the truth, and we better fear the truth. Rausch continues, taking seriously the idea that we might be wrong is not exactly a dogma. It is rather an intellectual style, an attitude, an ethic. What is to be said for this ethic? Not much. On its face, it is not provable. There is nothing especially rational or irrational about it. It is not an intellectually natural view... Sorry, I'm reading a book at an... Oops, I hit the microphone. I hope that didn't make too much sense. I'm reading the book at an awkward angle because when you have a microphone, that's what you do. It is not an intellectually neutral view of the world or a view that rises above faith since it is a kind of faith, faith in the belief that we are all fallible or we are not God. We cannot become God, make God, or speak with the authority of God. This is axiomatic in the beginning of wisdom and prosperity. He puts uh, here in scare quotes, kind of asking a rhetorical question. No, actually, he's quoting William James. Sorry. Why doubt itself is a decision of the widest practical reach, William James rightly said. The coil is about us. Struggle as we may. The only escape from faith is mental nullity. And he ends the quote. One cannot overstress this point, although often no amount of emphasis seems to drive it home. To adopt the attitude that you can never be completely sure you are right is a decision, a positive step. Not a void where commitments should be, but a kind of commitment to taking seriously that one might be wrong. In other words, it's a commitment to humility rather than to arrogance or nihilism. There is a different 
choice between hubris and nihilism, if we want to talk like Jordan Peterson, we really could. The, the nihilistic expression of the catastrophe of being itself is life is a calamity every day. Yeah, okay, great. So you need faith. What's the faith going to be in? It's a kind of commitment to taking seriously that one might be wrong. It's a commitment to humility and responsibility, if we really want to echo Jordan Peterson. If you are not inclined to doubt, you never even reach skepticism. It is simply not an issue. You simply believe without asking questions. That's the widely criticized form of faith called blind faith. It's also uh, sniffing your own farts, as it was put in South Park. It's also believing that your interpretation of your lived experience is infallible and unquestionable. It's also the kind of gnosis that comes with all Gnostic heresy. That is what you're renouncing. You're having faith instead in humility and the ability to learn something. What then, Rausch asks, is so important about the emergence, eventually the triumph, of the skeptical ethic? By the way, it's massively in doubt right now. It's massively being challenged right now. It is threatened, not just by the woke, but by a reaction on the right that says, no, maybe the, the Enlightenment was wrong. Maybe the, we need a counter-Enlightenment. Maybe we need to find a way to bind ourselves all together into some new emotional, mythopoetic story structure that moves us along through history. And I reject that utterly, and I'm in a lot of trouble with a lot of people right now, because what is being rejected is the heart of the Enlightenment itself, which is the emergence, eventually the triumph, of the skeptical ethic. In other words, the fallibilist ethic, which is humility incorporated, humility systematized. And he says the answer is this. Hidden in the pages of the skeptical philosopher's tomes is a radical social principle. It is the principle of public criticism. When people accept the notion that none of us is completely immune from error, they also implicitly accept that no person, no matter who he is or how strongly he believes, is above possible correction. If and if at any moment I can be wrong and you can be wrong and so can everyone else, all without being aware of it, then none of us can claim to have finally settled any dispute about the state of the external world. No one, therefore, is above critical scrutiny, nor is any belief. Guess what? We are all created politically equal because we are not God. It's the same idea. This is the fallibilist, skeptical triumph. This is the enlightenment this is the thing that these stupid New Age right-wing gurus or trad New Age right-wing gurus also want to tear down, just like the woke want to tear down so they can have their communist lived experience bullcrap elevated as some kind of a new uh, nociology in place of epistemology. This is epistemology. Those are nociologies. In other words, it's a kind of like trying to get to the truth where you already know a pretty good bit of it already and it can't really be questioned because you've got it from on high. Let me just read the punchline here, though, again. If at any moment I can be wrong and you can be wrong and so can everybody, everybody else, all without being aware of it, then none of us can claim to have finally settled any dispute about the state of the external world. No one, therefore, is above critical scrutiny, nor is any belief. The result is this. A society which has accepted skeptical principles will accept that sincere criticism is always legitimate, and that's in italics. One more time. A society which has accepted skeptical principles will accept that sincere criticism is always legitimate. In other words, if any belief may be wrong, then no one can legitimately claim to have ended any discussion ever. Now, there is a word in there that was in italics that's doing a lot of heavy lifting, and this is where communism, and this right-wing post-liberal nonsense are creeping in. That word is sincere. Sincere criticism is always legitimate. That's the principle. He didn't say criticism is always legitimate. Critical theory is virtually never legitimate. It always marries truth to a lie. It always blurs and blends contexts so that it can make a critique that's ruthless as opposed to sincere and fair and enlightening. In fact, that is the piece 
that is absolutely necessary. That is the missing piece right there that could solve all the problems that we've all been provoked into over the last 30 to 50 years. Sincere criticism, good faith criticism is always legitimate. Bad faith criticism, critical criticism in the critical theory sense is not always legitimate. Bad faith criticism can be shut out of the discussion every single time. You don't have to pretend it's all good faith. That's not liberalism. That is not classical liberalism. That is not any liberalism. That is being weak. That is being a doormat. That is opening yourself up to the worst kinds of manipulations, manipulators, grifters, borderline and narcissistic personality disorders, sociopaths, and psychopaths. That is exactly the thing that we have to be able to develop a sensitivity of discernment to find, identify, and say no to. Sincere criticism is always legitimate. Bad faith criticism need not apply. But Rausch summarizes this beautifully, and I don't want to take away from the the thrust, so I will reread the last sentence and then continue to the end of the page. In other words, if any belief may be wrong, then no one can legitimately claim to have ended any discussion ever. In other words, no one gets the final say. So there's one of your two principles of genuine epistemology. No one gets the final say. Another conclusion also follows. If any person may be in error, then no one can legitimately claim to be above being checked by others, ever. Moreover, if anyone may be in error, no one can legitimately claim to have any unique or personal powers to decide who is right and who is wrong. In other words, no one has personal authority. So that's as much of Rausch as I'm going to read, but those two principles, no one has final say and no one has special personal authority. In other words, all their authority is earned and borrowed. Those two principles define classical liberalism. So when you see these guys, especially on the post-liberal right, you sometimes hear this from the whack whack job on the left. They go out, but the right does this far more. The trad, the pomo trad right, postmodern traditionalists on the right, the mystics on the right go after uh, classical liberalism by bringing up, for example, that Isaac Newton was an alchemist, or that Francis Bacon was, in some regards, a hermeticist, or that you know all kinds of weird mystical things were imbued within the founding fathers of liberalism and thought, or that John Locke was completely wrong about the blank slate, and that Jean Jacques Rousseau took from John Locke the idea of the blank slate and created this total monster of a thing. So apparently now, literally, the most quintessential counter enlightenment thinker in Rousseau was somehow an Enlightenment thinker just by virtue of the fact that literally we know that Locke got something wrong, they actually are arguing from their religious mystical perspective, not from the perspective of fallibilist liberal science, as Rausch calls it. They are not arguing from the classical liberal perspective, so they are actually committing a category error. Locke doesn't get final say or have special authority, personal authority. It doesn't matter what the fuck Locke said. Locke laid out some ideas, some of which were right, and the process of epistemology allows us to chew up which parts of what he said were wheat and to discard the parts that were chaff. And this is, yes, they are right, an extraordinarily biblical thing. This is the idea of the wheat and the tares or the wheat and the chaff, either way. This is a very important concept. But we don't say, oh, Locke had mystical this and that, and Locke was extremely religious. Irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Just like how they don't care that John Adams was a Unitarian who denied the divinity of Christ when they quote and say that our Constitution was written for a moral and religious people and is wholly inadequate to the governance of any other in the attempt to establish a Christian nationalism that would exclude John Locke or sorry, John Adams, from their frickin' program. It doesn't matter that John Adams had certain things. The proposition that he put forth is valid. They're using it there to do what? To cut the limb that they're sitting on off out from under them. That's called a performative contradiction. That is, uh, that, that's not sincere criticism. It's ridiculous. It's not scholarly. It's not accurate. It's Therefore, not in the malicious sense, bad faith, but in the didn't-do-its-homework sense, bad faith. 
Uh, they'd say the same thing. Okay, so like Bacon and Newton and so on had lots of alchemy woven in to their beliefs. Okay, so what does that have to do with anything? We don't venerate Isaac Newton for his alchemy and whether it influenced his thinking that led to his mathematical theories and physics literally don't matter. His theory of gravitation doesn't have any alchemy in it anywhere. Literally none. Zero. Not a bit. Calculus. I mean, we could, I guess could get in a complicated philosophy of math argument about differentials, but we don't need to, and we could go back to Leibniz and, and monads and all of this crap. Well, we don't need to. Calculus doesn't have any mysticism, mysticism tucked in it anywhere. Differential equations doesn't have any mysticism tucked in it anywhere. They're axiomatic systems. You could say that some of the axioms are incorrect, but it's not mystical. It's the exact same thing, by the way, as model-dependent realism, that we live in axiomatic systems that are defined once we give the axiom. This is mathematics, mathematical philosophy. Once you define the axioms, the entire system is already defined by logic. So you choose a set of axioms, you choose a logic, you get the entire axiomatic system. That thing is called a mathematics, And then you can explore to find what truths, we call them theorems, uh, for example, what truths exist, what, what statements are true, what statements are false, what statements are decidable, and which statements are not decidable within that system. Ta-da! Okay, so what? It's, it's literally kind of how human beings deal with a sophisticated set system or knowledge system that has to go up against the fact that at the end of the day we have a impermeable, impermeable barrier that we can't cross to the realm of ontology. Okay, fine. Because why? Because we're limited. Because we're not God. All right? But when they give this criticism that there were all of these kind of um, mystics and faith-based people operating in the foundations of Western philosophy, classical liberalism, and so on, they are actually arguing from a category error. Maybe by accident, maybe intentionally, they're arguing in bad faith because classical liberalism doesn't put Locke on a pedestal. It doesn't put Jefferson on a pedestal. We refer to them because we I, we think that they made excellent points, and those points have survived much refutation. You could say, oh, no, Jefferson said all men are created equal, and we can see by the existence of mentally deficient people or whatever other weird arguments they want to get into that all people are not created equal. That's not what he was talking about. People are created politically equal. People are created equal in a sense in the sight of God. We don't know why they're here. We don't know what their purpose is, and it's not ours to interfere with it. So they're created equal in the sense of the amount of political authority that they intrinsically have, which is F and zero over anybody except themselves. And so they can't even get that right. Like they, they, they can't even get that right. This is just ma manipulating people. It's blending contexts yet again. Oh, equal in terms of how many muscles they have versus equal in terms of whether or not they deserve political authority. Yep. The argument, of course, is that the smarter people deserve more political authority, and that's exactly the platonic nightmare that Rausch starts. The entire first chapter of Kindly Inquisitors will drop you on the floor if you don't know much about how Plato described in Republic a tyranny that looks extremely like the World Economic Forum UN monstrosity that's coming all around today. There's a reason, because they're trying to recreate the platonic tyranny. It looks like communism, too. Um, you could just decide Hegel's trying to set up with his constitutional monarchies and philosophy of right, which is what this weird post-liberal new right wants to create, creating the platonic republic with a constitutional monarch kind of at the top. The philosopher kings, the truly smart and holy people get to be at the top, and everybody else is in the caste system down below, kind of like in India. Communism just takes the pyramid. That's Hegel. He re he reinvigorates the pyramid or reasserts the pyramid of, of, of uh, Plato's republic. Marx starts with the pyramid and just flips it over. And he tries to put all the communists, you know, they always say in the center, in the center, in the center, because when you flip a pyramid over, all the pieces fall down and only the center is on top. And what is on top of is a pile of rubble of destroyed uh, civilization. But the communists get to be on top and get to steal the spoils of that uh, society they destroyed. So they get to be on top of it for a short period of time. Anyway, I digress. The right-wing post-liberal argument against classical liberalism doesn't understand classical liberalism. It assumes that people have personal authority like Locke or Newton or something, so we have to look to them to their patterns of thought to decide 
what is going on with classical liberalism, which is exactly what they were moving away from and what we have moved away from in our epistemological methods and our political methods. Um, and secondly, uh, no one has final say. So if, if Locke said, we are blank slates, it doesn't matter. He doesn't have final say on the matter. And neuroscience and other things since have weighed in and said, no, bro, we're not blank slates. We're more like mostly blank contoured canvases. You can imagine a canvas that's already shaped like a face and you can paint it to make it look like a lot of different things. You can put a lot of personality on the underlying substrate, but you can't change the fact that the underlying substrate is shaped like a face. And you have to get pretty extreme and creative and use some pretty sophisticated techniques to make it even slightly able to hide beyond a slight contouring of that underlying structure. And if people who could move around it would still be able to see it. So um, we're not blank slates. Okay, so Locke was wrong about that. Next, that's actually the attitude because he's not on a pedestal. Now, there's a little bit of irony here because literally the picture on my uh, basis of classical liberalism essay is George Washington, a statue of George Washington praying with a sword by his side down on one knee. Um, but he's literally on a pedestal. But that's that's just me being stupid. That's not really relevant. So the point is that classical liberalism boils down to the idea that we're not God. Because we're not God, we're limited, we're finite, and we are fallible. Because we are fallible, we might all be wrong about anything that we believe, and we have very little right. We have, we have whatever right to try to persuade other people into joining us in any errors that we have, but we have no right because we can win them over and they can voluntarily decide to follow us or join us, but we have no right to compel them to believe anything that we believe, whether it's right or error, because at the end of the day, we might be wrong about the things we are certain of. So no one has special personal authority. In other words, all authority has to be earned, ideally through some version of merit with the consent of the people that are uh, involved in the relationship. And Nobody gets the final say, so nobody gets to be this, like, you know, king who said the correct thing, and then the argument's over. Those two things are off the table. Uh, that's classical liberalism. That's its knowledge method. It's, its economic and, and political system follow, but it all comes from the idea that we are not God. Uh, at the end of the day, that, that none of us possesses that intrinsic political authority. That's where our entire system comes from. I encourage you to read Kindly Inquisitors. I'll put a link to it. Um, it's a really, it's not a long book. It's not a hard to read book. It, it, Rausch is, was, is a journalist. So it has the virtue that most books written by journalists have, which is that it's a wonderful read. It's an engaging, interesting, straightforward, digestible page turner. Um, so I encourage you to read that and, and kind of be shocked that in 1991, he was seeing this issue so clearly. And I will talk to you on the next episode. Uh, not as God and as somebody who might very well be wrong and does not have the final say, except I have the last word of this podcast, which is thank you and good night.